Hello and welcome back to Crash Course. Today we're going to be looking at the third and final part of the population perspective revision. So today we're going to be looking particularly at the concept of need, so Bradshaw's taxonomy and Maslow's hierarchy. We're also going to be looking at sensitivity and specificity alongside Wilson and Younger criteria for um, screening and Clark and Leville's levels. Then we'll bring it right back to where we started with study designs by looking at bias, confounding and adjusting which can all be applied to different study designs. Last of all, we're going to finish with some equations, so a nice little summary, as well as looking at the structure of the NHS, which is relevant to your exams. So, remember last time we finished by looking at need, and we said that need's an interesting concept, and if someone demands something, we said, do they really need it? And if someone doesn't say anything at all, does that mean they don't need something? Well, Bradshaw tried to describe need, and he provided a methodology in making a real need possible. So his proposal was to first categorise the four types of social need, which can be seen here. So you have comparative need, felt need, normative need and express need. Let's have a look at normative need. It's based on professional judgement, so for example the need for treatment. Then you have felt need, so this is when an individual's perceptions of variation from normal health. Express need is the vocalisation of need, how people use the services, and keywords to look for here are demand. And then we have comparative need, so again this comes back to a professional judgement, but it comes to the relative needs of different groups in the population. Another way of looking at need is through Maslow's hierarchy. So Maslow suggested that human need can be structured into five categories, and essentially the need can be arranged in ascending order of prepotency and probability of appearance in a population. And with reference to service provision, which is what population perspective is all about, it's been claimed that services should be geared towards meeting these needs. So social problems are said to occur because these needs have not been met by the service. So these are the needs that Maslow presented. And at the top is self-actualization, which is achieving one's full potential and including creative activities. So it's a self-fulfillment need. Then the next two are psychological needs. So first of all, you have esteem needs, so prestige and feeling of accomplishment. And then you have belongingness and love needs, so intimate relationships and friends. And then you can break it down right down to the basic human needs. So safety needs, are you secure and are you safe? And uh, physiological needs, so food, warmth, water and rest. Things you need and depend on in your normal day-to-day -day life. Next we can look at sensitivity and specificity, which are statistical measures of performance of a classification test. So a classification test is testing, for example, if someone has a disease or not, and sensitivity and specificity are statistical measures of those tests. So sensitivity is a concept which essentially means the true positives, and in and in a minute, this will become a lot clearer as to what that means. But essentially, it measures the proportion of people that have the disease. And this test correctly identifies them as having the disease. Specificity are your true negatives. The people who don't have the disease, and the test genuinely says no, they do not have the disease. A good test is when the test has a good level of sensitivity and specificity. It can pick out those who have the disease and accurately say yes, they do have it, and it can pick out those who don't have the disease and accurately say no, they don't. So let's have a look at true positives then. So true positives are the people who have a disease and are identified as having the disease by the test. A true negative are people who do not have the disease and are identified by the test as not having the disease. So these are the things you want from a test. However, the things you don't want from a test are the false positives. So the people do not have the disease, but the test says that they do, so the test is wrong. False negatives are people who do have the disease, but the test says that they do not have the disease. And these are the things you don't want from a test. You want true positives, you want true negatives, but you do not want false positives and negatives. Why don't you want a false positive, for example? Well, they generate a lot of unnecessary worry. It tells someone that they have a disease when in actual fact they don't. And false negatives do the opposite. They delay a proper diagnosis and proper treatment. It can almost put people's minds at rest telling them they don't have a disease when really they do.
So the equations that allow us to work out sensitivity and specificity are sensitivity is true positives divided by true positives and false negatives, and specificity are true negatives divided by true negatives and false positives. So how can we apply that to a test? Because it's not very useful for clinicians and um, patients to understand whether a test is very good. So actually, doctors use positive predictive values and ne negative predictive values, which are much more clinically relevant. So a positive predicted value is the chance, if you test positive, that you'll actually have the disease. And a negative predicted value is the chance if you test negative, that you'll not have the disease. So this also refers to how good a test is at detecting a disease, but it's a much easier number to manage for clinicians and patients when understanding how good a test is. Moving on then, we can continue on that idea of screening and, um, and testing people for disease. So screening is an important example of that secondary level disease prevention which we covered in the last video. It allows us to identify members of a population that haven't currently got a disease. So you're testing people that haven't got signs and symptoms. You're testing otherwise, as far as you know, healthy individuals that fall into a category of risk. Therefore, like we've said, it's done on healthy people. So how do we decide who to screen? And this comes back to the Wilson and Younger criteria, because they set out a list of essentially 10 targets for all screening programs must aim to meet. So they said that the condition sort should be uh, an important health problem. There should be an accepted treatment for patients with recognised disease. There's no point screening someone for a disease if you then say, well, we can't treat you, we've got nothing to help you. Have you got the facilities for diagnosis and treatment? There should be recognisable latent or early symptomatic stages, so people that you can put into a risk factor group. There should be a suitable test or examination, so a test that works has a good specificity and sensitivity. And the test should be acceptable to the population, so coming back to Maxwell's three A's and three E's. The natural history of the condition, including development, should be adequately understood. There should be an agreed policy for whom we treat as patients. And the cost of case finding should be economically balanced in relation to the possible expenditure on medical care as a whole. And then the last one is that the case finding should be a continuing process and not a once and for all kind of product. So when we're thinking about screening, it's important to think about who actually goes for screening. And statistically, men are much less likely to be screened than women, but much less likely to go for screening. Likewise, lesbian and bisexual women are less likely to be screened. People in poorer or deprived areas are less likely to be screened as well. And those with learning or physical disabilities are also less likely to go and be screened for a disease. This brings us on to Clark and Neville's levels. So this was already kind of touched on in levels of disease prevention in primary, secondary and tertiary. But to cover this in a little bit more detail, you can have primary, remember. So this is the target population, those who are at risk but haven't yet got something. And it prevents the transmission of disease. Secondary-wise, we can the target population of those who've just been diagnosed, so they're early or asymptomatic diseases, and the aim is to prevent disease in cases where the infection has already occurred. So screening is an example of a secondary-level disease prevention. And then tertiary, we target people who have already got established disease, and we are trying to prevent morbidity and mortality once this disease has been established. Next, we want to look at the types of bias, confounding and adjusting, and this can be applied to what we discussed in the first video of the different types of study design. So first, let's look at confounding. So essentially, when we're testing a hypothesis, we want to know if it's the exposure or the risk factor that causes the outcome. So applying this to a real life situation, we may want to know, well, does smoking, which may be the exposure or the risk factor, cause lung cancer, which would be your outcome? Then we want to say, well, in that effect, in that tested group, is there anything else that may cause lung cancer or link to the exposure and outcome? So, for example, alcohol consumption or coffee drinking may be a confounder in this situation. And this is usually summarized in a three-step um, diagram. So you have the exposure here, which causes the outcome. And then you have this confounding variable, which could act to skew the results and um, affect whether the exposure directly links to the outcome. So because confounding affects the outcome, we've got to try and remove confounders in all the tests we do to make it a fair test. And we do this by adjusting, and this can be done in three ways. 
So standardization, stratification, and regression. And standardization is the one I'm going to focus on mainly for this video. So standardization can be direct or indirect, and it allows you to compare two normally incomparable populations. So one key difference is that the indirect produces a standardized mortality ratio, and the direct method produces a standardized mortality rate, and it's important to differentiate between those. So the indirect method produces this ratio, which is the ratio of the number of deaths observed in the study population to the number that would be expected if the study population had the same specific rate as a standard population. A bit mind-boggling, take it step by step and try to understand what it means. And then the direct aspect is that it produces a rate, so an actual number that can be used to compare the study population with the other population similar to the standard population. So stratification is another method, which is where you can separate the sample into several sub-samples -sub according to a specific criteria, such as age group or socioeconomic status. And this allows comparison to be fair and of similar people. Lastly, we want to look at bias. So selection bias is when proper randomization is not achieved to choose a sample. So the people being selected, it's a bias selection. Recall bias. So this is when people remember things differently. So for example, those with a diagnosed disease may remember the events more clearly because it's stuck in their mind. Whereas those who haven't been diagnosed probably won't remember the procedure as well because they've not been diagnosed. The lead time, so this is early diagnosis, leads to overestimate of survival or cure rate. And length time is a dispro disproportionate number of long duration cases. And then observer or research bias, so the first two and the last one here are the main ones you need to know about. So observer or research bias is the tendency to see what we expect to see or what we want to see in a study, whilst actually the reality may be that it's not what we expect. So then to summarise, we'll have a quick look at the NHS um, structure and we'll have a look at some of the equations you need to know. So the Black Report came out in 1980 and essentially it's a report that proposed different reasons for health inequalities. So things such as poor health equals poor people, poor people equal poor health and so on. And it looked at structural aspects as well such as economics and structural factors. So Collies and DALYs DALYs, um, are implemented to measure the burden of disease and capture expected years of life left and the quality of that time. So equation summary, we've looked at sensitivity and specificity in this PowerPoint. Crude birth rate, again we looked at in the birth aspect and fertility rate as well. Infant mortality rate, and a few more equations here, so perinatal mortality rate, case fatality rate, instance prevalence, crude all-cause mortality rate, and cause-specific mortality rate. And these have a tendency to come up in those first year exams um, asking you to calculate them from a scenario. That's the everything for population perspective. If you do think I've missed anything, please do let me know so I can go back and edit it into the slides which are now available on the documents page um, of the website. Um, and if you do have any feedback, please as always do let me know um, because it will be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you found the video useful.